Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Retail Touchpoints webinar. Neiman Marcus shares insider tips on retiring monolithic tech and embracing modern composable architecture. I'm Adam Blair, editor of Retail Touchpoints, and I'll be moderating today's session. You'll hear from a top Neiman Marcus executive about the retailer's journey toward a composable tech architecture, and also discover the business benefits of automating image and video management and delivery, along with tips for a successful transformation, including getting both internal teams and partners aboard. For anyone who's watching who may be new to Retail Touchpoints, first, welcome. And when the session is over, I encourage you to join our community. You can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, and of course, check out our great assortment of content and resources, which includes everything from breaking news to timely trend pieces and success stories, as well as detailed benchmark research reports, videos, podcasts, and lots more webinars like this. And to make things even easier, you can subscribe to our newsletter to get the latest news and content delivered right to your email inbox several times a week. And if you didn't know, we also do live events. Our Retail Innovation Conference and Expo is back in Chicago, June 13th through the 15th with three jam-packed days of content, networking, and exploration. Don't just see what's next in connected commerce, you can experience it firsthand and learn how to create it for your customers. Go to rice.events, R-I-C-E dot events, and see why executives from Dollar General, Coach, Walmart, Liquid Death, General Mills, Brookfield Properties, and many, many more are gonna be joining us this June in Chicago. Now we can just take a quick look at the platform we're gonna be using today. This is the ON24 console that you're looking at right now, and it can be completely customized. You can move and resize windows, make the video or slides larger or smaller as you like. You'll also find an array of interactive tools in this experience. Starting from the left on the bottom toolbar, you'll see a media player button for your video and volume. There's also a Q&A box. You can submit your questions in this widget, which is located at the top right of your screen. And we'll get to the, as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. There's also a resource list that you can click through to download the slides as well as resources that the speakers have provided. And perhaps most important is the survey icon, which you can click to share your feedback at any point during the session. Your input's extremely important to us, so before logging off today, please be sure to take a moment to share your feedback to help us improve future events. If you need, have any follow-up questions or you need help with your experience, just press the help icon to get further guidance. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Bridget Roman is the Senior Product Marketing Manager overseeing go-to-market efforts for platform extensibility and partner engagement for Cloudinary. She's been in SaaS product marketing for nearly 20 years, working for leading tech companies, including Apple, Adobe, and eBay. Milan Pansari is VP of Product Marketing at Cloudinary. He's led marketing, business development, product, and software engineering teams at startups, incubators, and Silicon Valley tech icons for 30 years. And Sri Kalavacharla is Senior Director, Omni Personalization and Engagement Engineering at Neiman Marcus. He's a technology leader with over 20 years of experience in e-commerce, ad server, app store, healthcare, and rebate processing domains. He's been with Neiman Marcus Group for nine years, specializing in end-to-end -end architecture and reimagine efforts. And now I'm gonna hand things off to Bridget. Thank you so much, Adam, and I'm excited to be here uh, with everybody today. We have an amazing set of um, folks in the room today, and we're really looking forward to telling this great story. I'll be hosting and kind of walking everybody through the questions and leading the conversation with Milland and with Sri, and we're really excited to dive in and get started. Um, what I wanted to do is just take a couple of minutes to let Sri and Milland talk a little bit more about their roles specifically and give us a little overview about each company. So Shri, I'm gonna hand off to you and have you walk us through the Neiman Marcus groups and talk a little bit about your role. You have the word omni-channel in your title. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, um, so like Nosa Plus Full, um, yeah, like Nosa is like my title, like Nosa Senior Director, Omni Personalization and Engagement Engineering. I know it's a mouthful, <laughs> like, you know, so what that really means is like, I oversee the top end of funnel for all of our brands. And for one of our brands, I oversee end to end and also like internal applications, which help us to categorize products, merchandise products, and also consume and create product catalog for online. And um, anytime there are very large cross cutting projects, product catalog area being biggest consumer, I need to ensure the technical strategy is coming together correctly. And, um, and a bit about, uh, our group, like you no, know, so yes, Neiman Marcus. Uh, probably you guys are aware, like you no, know, is a more popular brand of ours, but also 
We have another brand called Bertoff Goodman. We have an iconic store in New York. Um, go visit it. <laughs> it is, um, both Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman, they focus on luxury retail. The difference being Bergdorf Goodman is uh, even ultra luxury. And uh, uh, besides these two, like you know, we also have another brand called Harchop, uh, which focuses on furniture. Um, so uh, when it comes to Omni, like it's this, um, uh, we, um, anything we do internally, like, and so we always like, and so want to do it um, from the core, like, and you know, so not ever do something which would only work for, uh, like, you know, it's just the one specific channel, right? Like, for example, like, and so we'll talk more about it later, but, but let's say if I do HTML, then how would I do it in the app, right? And so on. So that's a bit about me and the company. Great. Thank you so much. And I have to say, occasionally I shop at, all of these stores. <laughs> All right. And so let's move on. Milland, I want to give you a moment to talk about Cloudinary and talk about your role at Cloudinary. So everybody's familiar um, with, with what we do. Great. Thanks a lot, Bridget. And uh, amazing to be here with you three as well. And I wish I shopped more at Neiman Marcus. I shop as much as I can afford to. Uh, nice. But a little bit about, uh, you know, I'm part of the product team here at Cloudinary and lead specifically product and technical um, marketing at Cloudinary. And uh, just a little bit for some of you who may be familiar with Cloudinary, others may not. We are essentially the image and video platform, technology platform that's used by over 10,000 of the most engaging brands in the world. Uh, the world's largest sportswear manufacturers, some of the most iconic uh, car brands, media and entertainment. Um, you know, when you go to a website and you're shopping for e-commerce or you're on a media and entertainment news site, you're probably using Cloudinary without even knowing it. Uh, if the images look good and the videos look good, most likely chances are that's Cloudinary. Uh, so again, we are across multiple industries, uh, over 10,000 uh, paying customers using us. Uh, we have a very strong API-first developer culture. That's how we were born as cloud-native technology. And so we have over 1.25 million developers that use Cloudinary, all the way from these iconic brands to individual developers and very small and medium companies as well. Um, and our products, uh, there are two main products that we talk about. One is our API-based product for image and video, which is called Programmable Media. And the other is uh, Cloudinary Assets, which is an add-on that you use with this, which gives you a single source of truth and a, a modern approach to digital asset management. Um, so let me pause and hand it back to you, Bridget. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So we're gonna to start to dive into our questions. And Shri, the first one is really for you. The title of this webinar is all about retiring your monolithic tech stack. So I'd love for you to start us off and kind of dive us into what your tech stack um, for Neiman Marcus Group used to look like. Where, where did you start? What were your challenges that you were facing? And just kind of take us back in time to help everybody understand what you were really working with. Yeah, definitely. Like, and so we started our journey back in 2016. Like, so now it's already. Now I think, look, think about it. It's already six plus years. But, but uh, our websites have been on a monolithic platform from 1999 through 2016, 17 years. And uh, but also we were deploying twice a month to production. So and uh, like uh, uh, Milan uh, briefly touched upon. So like we were uh, typically, or at least at the time when we uh, anybody talks about microservices and so on like you know the first thing that comes to mind is scale right like so scale is not really uh, what we were after like you no know, so or or will not will never be an uh, uh, issue for neiman marcus group unless everybody in america becomes super rich to shop at neiman marcus that's a fantastic problem to have like you know, so, but but we were not after scale like you know so uh, so we were deploying twice a month scale is not the issue then um uh, like so, uh, like so, let's think about what what else could be the drivers, right? So even if there were stability or performance of the issues, it's always cheaper, faster, easier to enhance what you already have than going for something completely different, right? So like so, as we were, I was the lead architect at the time, and we were writing our vision and go guidelines, and also uh, I would say this, like so, talking to your business partners is very very critical. Right, like so getting their point of view because as a technology team, you could be thinking you're doing your best and, and 
what else you can gain by going uh, to a micro microservices or API positive approach, right? So I still remember one of our SVPs, like I said, what she said was really like, I have had this idea, let's say like in April, and by the time it goes through budgeting, architecture, development, testing, performance testing, and finally you, you deploy it to production, it is January, 2024. So which means my idea is already nine months old and probably my idea is based on what I have observed in January, 2023, right? So, so how, can, how can I put my idea in front of customers uh, like also in May, right? Like also instead of waiting for one whole year. So that was the pivot moment. Like, you know, so we knew like no matter what we do on top of our monolithic uh, platform, we would not be able to achieve that, right? So we were after agility, like, you know, so we need, we wanted to build ourselves a platform which will allow us to experiment, iterate upon, and, and also if we were wrong to fail fast, right? Like, you know, so which is, which is a very, very important thing. Like, you know, so we have realized we can talk more about it um, later, but, um, so that's when the journey has begun, and um, like and also a lot of discovery and decisions, right? Like and also, so we have created several pillars slash silos, however you want to call them, like you no know, infrastructure, platform, application tier, uh, data store, search engine, uh, UI, CI, CD, branching strategy, logging, monitoring, CDN, security, experimentation, yes, and uh, enterprise like and also, uh, omni-channel content strategy under that. Uh, pillar like you NOSO know, DAM and CMS, right? So I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, but but um, and and like so once we have uh, like created all these pillars, then we started uh, like figuring out doing a lot of POCs, what's available in under each of these pillars, and also we wanted to ensure like a decision made in a particular pillar is not going to like you NOSO know, will work well with a decision like so be, will be made or or made in another pillar, right? Like you not know, just uh, and that's how. Uh, we have begun our journey, and um, like at this end, like any other company, probably at the time we started our journey as uh, to, to we wanted to be cloud agnostic, um, and also we considered multi-cloud strategy, and uh, we did start that way. And even like in, in the process, we have shifted to be cloud native. Now, like you know, so there is no silver bullet here. Every company needs to figure what's best for them. Uh, like it's just the, and they both have their pros and cons, but for our setup, like we realized that we're okay with the uh, cons, uh, the cloud native strategy, the cons it will bring to the table in comparison to the pros we get. And and uh, like now if it's not obvious, like in you know, a cost is certainly uh, one of the things to consider when you are uh, like so, um, choosing between being cloud agnostic and uh, cloud natives, yeah. Um, so in nutshell, that has been our uh, journey. Like, you know, it's just the, um, like it's just the, uh, we, we started started uh, being uh, cloud agnostic and uh, and then in this process, I would say like, so the biggest prize for us is actually building a resilient platform. Like I already mentioned, like, so which helped us, which will help us to experiment on top of it, like you not know, just sort of learn from it. And even if we uh, make a mistake, right? Like you not know, just sort of, um, um, pivot and and um, go for another technology in that area. Hey, Shri, can I jump in and I, I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about how you discovered Composable and then how you started to make your choices around the different technologies in your Composable commerce tech stack? Curious about that. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, so, so coming from a monolithic platform, like, it's just, so until, until that point, like, it's just, so we only have had this exposure that, like, you know, so everything is contained and it, it works. Anytime we make a network call, like, you know, it's just the, um, like, you know, so it can work or it may not work. Now, from that point to actually, like, proposing a, a architecture, like, you know, so which is 100% based on network calls, like, you know, so how would we need to ensure so that would work, right? Like, you know, so the first thing that we want, it, uh, circuit breaker design pattern or hystrix is one of the first very first things like and so we have uh, experimented with and then uh, we very quickly realized like you know so there are two important things right like you know it's just the one is um domain driven design slash product architecture right like you know it's just the, and, and correspondingly what kind of structure will will uh, like work the best for that for it right so so the the domain driven, like oftentimes, like you know, so, so um, um, like so, one would say like there is already an org structure, and let let me force this org structure onto the new uh, uh, new setup, so that will never work. Instead, you need to almost take a like a, um, a blank slate and come up with your product architecture, and then align yourselves to that uh, setup. 
And, um, and then, like I said, the domain-driven design is, is uh, behind, like it says, everything we started doing from that point onwards, which means that now teams can only talk with each other uh, via APIs. Like, you know, so yes, it is very easy to just like cross boundaries and then like, you know, so, so go into someone else's data store and fetch data, but, but then everything will start breaking, right? Like, you know, so, so these were some of the guidelines they evolve very quickly and, and it's important to also have the right team uh, to actually go with it because um, it's very much, you would hear these conversations or arguments like, hey, I have, I, I'm accustomed to doing this so and so for the past 17 years, why cannot I do that on the new platform too? But then if you want to do the same thing on the new platform, you may as well stay on the current platform and save yourself millions of dollars, right? So. So uh, kind of uh, leading off on that, I'm really, you talked about building the right team. And I'm curious, I know your team sort of created this center of excellence, this IT center of excellence. Can you talk a little bit about the governance that you're using for your whole family of brands? It sounds like you've really worked hard as part of this composable tech stack to make sure you've put kind of guardrails around. So you, you've chosen the best of breed products um, and then there's guardrails around, you know, introducing any new products into your tech stack. But be curious to know a little bit about the governance within the IT organization. Yeah, certainly. Like it's just the, I mean, like it's like I said, like it's at the time I was a um, before this program started, I was a lead architect, and there was an architecture team I was leading. Like so, which means like all the initiatives would would come to the architecture team, and uh, like so, so we would do. Uh, we will figure like it's so um, three different options. Let's say there's a Cadillac option. There is Malibu, uh, like you know, so or and then the uh, Chevy Malibu, and then there's a Ford Focus option, right? Like you know, so and and that's how like it was, but it was horizontal, right? Like you know, so and, and it was uh, very hierarchical, and uh, so one of the things we had to do, like you know, so to succeed in this new model, like it's so we were like we we have uh, until then like that model was about project teams, and and we had to pivot to being product teams, right? Like you no, know, so. Um, so th it, they are very, very different. Product team is like a circle. Like it's nobody is really reporting to anybody. It's like a mini company inside the company. And uh, it's, it's, and also they have their own goals. Like it's just the monetary goals. Like, you know, so uh, they uh, commit to like, it's I would generate this much of like, you know, so um, quote unquote revenue and, and, and corresponding hand it over to the next team, right? Like the request, but which also means that uh, like, you know, so many things like, you know, so flowing to that, like, you know, so, so um, like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, you build, you run mentality. Like, you know, it's just the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the idea being there is let's say like, as I'm, I wrote a piece of code, like, you know, so, and, uh, if that doesn't work, I will be woken up at 3 AM in the night. The, the chances are I would write it in such a way, not only me, nobody has to wake up in the night, right? Like, you know, so, and, and I mean, in the night I would like to sleep and, and so would everybody. So, so it is that, and another thing we have done, like, you know, so, uh, is, uh, for example, anybody can deploy anything uh, to uh, production at any point of time by simply issuing a command in a Slack channel, right? So deploying something to production is not that big of a deal, but ensuring it will actually work is a big deal, right? Like, and so, and, and um, so because like it's another thing is like no safety, right? Like, no, so oftentimes people attach themselves to the decisions they make or uh, like, you know, just the technology that they knew about, they know about, right? Like, no, so, Detaching people from that is also another key key uh, thing to do, right? Like so because people are are your asset, right? Like you know, so um, like it's just the um, otherwise like what will happen is like you know, so people will fight tooth and nail. Like you know, so I want to keep this old technology here because I don't know anything else to do, right? Like you know, so but 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 your people like you know, so know a lot. Like you know, so the domain knowledge they bring to the table, the experience they bring to the table, right? Like you know, and so on. So. Or for that matter, even with me, I guess this before 2016, uh, like you know, this, I was not an expert in uh, cloud native uh, technologies and Neiman Marcus Group did not kick me out and said like, you know, like you know, so, uh, we're good, we'll take it from here, right? Like they gave me an opportunity and, and same thing, right? Like you know, so uh, investing in your people um, and also the product teams was, is at the core of everything we do. And, and that helped to uh, like, you know, so hit all of our uh, goals. Great, so thank you for that. One other thing I wanted to touch on and when we think about your journey um, and just kind of the beginning stages, what were the North Stars that you kind of 
set forth for you and for your team, the, the key goals. I know in a couple of past conversations we've had, you said that you always stayed focused on the goal, no matter what the choices were, you kind of always brought it back to whatever that North Star was. So can you share with everybody? Because I think that's a really important aspect of this journey is keeping your eye on the goal and not deviating from that and why that's a, you know, a, a best practice of yours. Yeah, I mean, like it's, it's the, so one of the one of the uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, focus on like also maybe like it's one of those things like you know, so like like um, like I quoted uh, like one of our SVPs right like you know, so giving ourselves ability to um, uh, iterate upon right like you know it's just the because uh, until then I'll I'll uh, I'll actually mention this right like it's so um, our first demo to our president uh, uh, sorry to our CEO at the time was like so there was a there was a web page and it all it had was like Neiman Marcus logo and it was blank. And 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 we put it in fact, I mean, it was it was completely unheard of and frowned upon to actually show something of that sort to the CEO of the company. And 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 I remember like so she uh, uh, looked next to her president, like no, and so like what am I looking at? Right. So so what and, and we explained to her what you're looking at is like so we provisioned an environment in eight minutes which in the past took six months, right? Like this is before we were on cloud. So it's, it's um, so it is that um, like it's a, we, uh, we told to ourselves like it's just the, we can do all fancy things, but it's still very important to actually like think that way. Like, you know, so when we come up with an idea, what is that? I mean, like oftentimes an MVP is um, abused, <laughs> like, you know, so for lack of better words, like, you know, so, uh, MVP is uh, anything but MVP. Oftentimes, it's like a fully viable product, right? Like, and so because um, until then, like, and so we were accustomed to you get one shot, so you ask for everything and moon, so that like, and so you get all of those things now, which means that you spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and most importantly, during that time, what your competitors are doing, right? Like, and so, so that is that is like, and so, so if you are not doing the right thing, then you you went back by two x, right? Like, and so. so on um, like a re uh, uh, training ourselves to say like as a what is the minimum I wanted to put in front of customers right and to do so like you know it's just a, and I wanted to be very ROI driven right like you know it's just the and and uh, to do so like and so that means I need to have a good experimentation like and so stack right like you know so um, and and all these things go hand in hand but but um, it is uh, that that retraining ourselves to ask for just bare minimum, put it in front of the customer and not to attach ourselves to that, like you know, if that fails, right? Like you know, it's just the, um, so, so that that's that was the key. And and um, and personally for me, like it's before that, um, like we have had a project, for example, like it says we have had these lofty goals and 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 uh, it was a big project and and we ran it like it, it ran for a year or so, and then like you know, it's just the uh, but but in the end, like when I, we built a fantastic uh, product there. But but eventually we realized like it's the um, not very many customers wanted that, right? Like so we wanted to avoid mistakes like that, and uh, to do so, uh, like it's just the um, we need to we need to like so all, all those things to should come together, right? So people and technology for sure needs to come together, and and processes are there to work. I love that. So some of these ideas you're talking about, always thinking about ROI, retraining your team, almost like that fail fast mentality of getting things in front of the customer as quickly as you can to try to learn and avoid future mistakes and experiment. So it sounds like you really have a spirit of experimentation happening on your team, which is really great. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I want to give Millen a moment to be able to talk. I, I think um, maybe backing up even a little bit when we think about what composable architecture is. I'm going to just change the slides up. And Milind, I'd love to have you speak a little bit about composable. So we're looking at this um, kind of an architecture here on the slide and maybe speak a bit to other Cloudinary customers that you're seeing. If, if you're hearing similar sentiments from them as what we're hearing from Sri today around uh, moving toward composable and away from monolithic architecture. Yeah, thanks. I'd love to, Bridget. I mean, I'm going back to my computer science roots here, so I get to geek out a little bit on the underlying technology. But really, if you look at it, you know, over the last 30 years, we've done a lot of different generations of digital transformation. Uh, 
And what's happening with this new movement around composable architectures is that we're finally giving the end customer, uh, the end brand or the end developer, the opportunity to select best of breed components, right? And we're breaking that kind of big, you have to buy it from one vendor kind of monolith. Uh, so I think that's an important piece. Uh, Sri mentioned a couple of key tenets of that, which is microservices based, API first, cloud native and headless. It's another term that we throw in there. Uh, we are one of the founding members of this alliance called the Mark Alliance. So I'm kind of using their architecture slide, which is really kind of a reference architecture, if you will for how you as a brand, if you're thinking about moving to a more modern architecture, this gives you one possible blueprint for how you might kind of take small bite-sized uh, bite steps, if you will, rather than try and swallow the whole, the whole beast, if you will, right? Um, and so you can start on the very left with your CMS, for example, that's the experience management side. A lot of people do that. Sometimes you might start kind of at the bottom with the commerce part of it or the data layer part of it. And uh, Sri mentioned this, uh, you know, obviously in the case of Neiman Marcus, uh, being an amazing customer of Cloudinary, um, you know, you can start with the media layer, which is the image and video foundational technology itself that you use and create a single source of truth and then start replacing portions around it that were taking up bits of your image and video processing, but not doing a great job. So you can now go with a modern CMS, uh, maybe a composable CMS. Um, and I know uh, at Neiman Marcus 3, uh, you'll probably talk about this. Uh, you know, you're using one of our partners as the CMS there. Um, so, so it's really all about integrating, using APIs, a best of breed architecture. And you don't have to completely rip and replace the big monolith that you've bought. You can take out pieces of it, right? You might just take out the dynamic media manipulation out of that monolith first and then start with that. So that's really the, the whole notion of a composable architecture. Uh, you can educate yourself either by reading stuff from the Mark Alliance uh, as one organization, uh, but you can also, uh, you know, kind of read up a little bit more about it. It's a real movement, I'm excited about it. Uh, and it's all about enabling developers first, uh, creating a single source of truth as far as we at Cloudinary are concerned for image and video as your foundational technology that you can plug into. And then really letting you, be, you know, not locking you into anything, including our own technology, right? Uh, that's that's one of the prices you pay for going with the modern composable architecture. So so I'll pause there. I'll throw it back to uh, Sri and Bridget and uh, see if you guys want to add more color to to your own journey there. Yeah, Sri, anything you'd like to say to uh, to close up on this idea? No, oh, that's great. Like so, what what Milan mentioned is exactly it, right. Like you know, just the. Um, I didn't mention any specific technologies, like like you know, so like because um, like you know, so, so that there is no like you know, so one recipe fits all, but but um, at the core, like you know, so that that is really what it is, right? So. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to talk about uh, content strategy, and this is of course near and dear to our hearts here at Cloudinary. We're all about images and video, but when you think about you know building out this amazing new composable architecture for the Neiman Marcus Group. Um, at the core of it is content. The whole reason to create this new um, architecture is to be able to deliver experiences faster and better and experiences that are more immersive and all of that. So I would love to spend the next few minutes talking about your content strategy and how you know that factored into the overall strategy for moving away from monolithic how did your content strategy kind of take place? Did you have cost considerations? Um, and I would love to also uh, talk about single source of truth and, and moving to this model where you went from, you talked about the different silos and of course that means your content was also siloed. So um, being in this composable space now, you've actually got the opportunity to have a single repository for all of these great visual assets. Um, so I'll stop there and let you kind of field some of those questions 
Um, sure. And, uh, I mean, this is um, uh, like this is this is pretty easy decision for us because we didn't have a uh, like also a true dam before um, before we uh, hopped on to Cloudinary. Like so, we were using a web server and. Uh, Pretty much like you know, so, um, <clears throat> like uh, so a lot of directories and some naming convention only uh, one understands if you're working at Neiman Marcus, right? Like you now it's say, and um, I mean, so one would assume like you know, so it's a cheaper solution, but in reality it's not, right? Like I'll tell you why. Think of this way, like you know, so let's say you want to show the same image on a product listing page, a smaller thumbnail versus on a PDP, a larger image, or on a or in your native application, which could be at a different resolution, different optimization level, or for like you know, so for that experience, or in an email, right? So 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 which means like somebody needs to now cut four different images at different sizes, different optimization levels, and all the effort that goes into it, and the uh, the team you need to have to do so, right? Like you know, so that will all add up, right? Like and so without necessarily adding a lot of value. And uh, so that's where really a dam comes into picture, right? Like you know, so in my mind. So once we have uh, like so uh, made the choice with, uh, with with Cloudinary, like you know, so the a very important thing for us to do is again like you know, so the to not bring in again like you know, so what we are been doing on the file servers, like you know, so or or web server to Cloudinary. Learn about what Cloudinary has to offer and use them to your advantage, right? Like you know, so be it like metadata, like you know, so you can set up on the assets or workflow, like you know, so that is available in Cloudinary and its integration with the CDN, inbuilt CDN, and how it tailor it delivers uh, like you not know, just the, uh, your assets uh, rightly optimized for that particular channel, right? Like you know, so taking advantage of these things, like you know, so will start your journey. And, and it did start our journey as well. Now, um, once and also like like uh, Bridget was mentioning about like you know, so, so now you have your dam you need to start utilizing it have it as a enterprise dam where you have all your assets like you now it's a centralized repository so which means so now like you now so, so you also need to ensure that any related uh, like you now so, so any other applications have seamless integration into your dam right so otherwise let's say like you now so think of this way I mean like you now so let's say there is a there is a team like so which is cutting which is creating all your product catalog images and then there is another team which is doing all the marketing images and let's say they have chosen two different technologies and they don't talk with each other so that means like so exactly that right so if i'm let's say like so in a cms content management system i don't have i have access to this set or that set right like so so we need to ensure that like so going forward or from that point of on time like not just the uh, anything uh, we uh, pick up, like you know, so, so it has that seamless integration, so that you can you can truly take advantage of like so what you have uh, in us today. So. Okay, I'm going to take this opportunity to fast forward to a quote that you, you know, you said this several months ago, which we of course absolutely love at Cloudinary. So Cloudinary has been at the core of your omni-channel content strategy, and has since become a key requirement for you to ensure any related products that you pursue have out of the box support for Cloudinary. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so like, you know, this is the, um, certainly like, and so at, at minimum, like, you know, this is the, uh, when, uh, also when Melin mentioned about headless, right? Like, you know, it's just the, so it, it all needs to, so once, like, you know, so like, like I was mentioning in the earlier, uh, earlier, earlier as well, like, you know, this is the, so decisions we make in one area should, should, Come together, like you no, know, so, so uh, for other areas too, right? Like and so when, you, like it's the, uh, for example, like uh, if I think about let's say a content management system, right? Like you no, know, so, so there are traditional content management systems where uh, they they work as a class, right? Like so meaning like so you would put your website in that content management system and then which means like you no, know, so, so it thinks everything is static in nature, but but for e-commerce companies anything is seldom static, right? Like and so they are highly dynamic. So, which means that, like, and so we wanted a headless CMS, like, and so our, our content as a service pattern, right? Like, and so, and and uh, for that uh, for that CMS, now I do not want to copy all the assets again to this CMS, like whichever CMS I pick, right? Like, and so, so that will be a nightmare, right? So, so hence, uh, like, so we picked a CMS which works really well with Cloudinary, and 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 uh, and when we were actually evaluating different content management systems so that became a requirement in in fact it became a sticking requirement so yeah okay, great 
Thank you. That's excellent to hear. Are there any, I'm just kind of curious, are there any key milestones you've hit or any kind of achievements around your content strategy that have been kind of, you know, celebrated on your team across the company, just things that you've been able to achieve that you would never have been able to do with monolithic tech stack? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, so this is um, uh, like, so one is like not specific to Cloudinary, one is uh, like a specific to CM or, or combination of CMS and Cloudinary, right? Like, you know, so so one one pleasant surprise we got, like, you know, so or I realized was like, so once we moved to um, uh, Cloudinary, uh, like so Neiman Marcus is about luxury retail, right? Like, which means like, you know, so very visual storytelling, like, like, you know, so, so the, um, the bigger crest images, right? Like, you know, so the, uh, imagine like you know, so our customers like you know, so are, are so accustomed to having a very pampered experience and and when they come to store or go to stores they have uh, like you know, associates who know about them like likes dislikes and whatnot to bring them to online right like you not know, so, so also bring them to online right like you not know, so we need to create that kind of a storytelling and to do that uh, images play a significant role now like you know so if you if you simply ask a tech guy like you not know, so, so oh well like you know so if I um, put a TIFF image out there, like you know, so that site will never load, right? Like you know, so, so that is where, uh, like you know, so uh, like a Cloudinary's capabilities, like you know, so where it delivers that rightly sized, uh, rightly optimized uh, image for that channel help greatly. Like you not know, though we actually like you know, so, so we have increased our website layout, right? Like you know, so, so that it can accommodate bigger, nicer pictures. But like you know, so, so uh, also we have improved performance. I know like you know it it it, it feels counterintuitive, but but because we uh, like now have an enterprise dam, it helped uh, on the performance side. So now, second one I wanted to talk about is like, so when we have this seamless integration with um, content management system, it is more probably towards like, so having a headless CMS, like you know, this is a versus a classic CMS, like it's just the, so in that scenario, actually our, after we implemented a headless CMS in, in uh, conjunction with like, so Cloudinary, uh, as the backing asset uh, repository, it's like it's our creative team came back and said like, no, so, hey, tech team, you guys are uh, cranking things faster than we can imagine. So so we are running out of ideas, right? Like, no, so that is the uh, probably the, the biggest win, like, no, so in that area, like, no, so, so anyone could probably ever have. So. Yeah, that's a great problem to have. In yeah. a second, I'm going to have Milan talk through a couple of key um, use cases that Cloudinary can deliver on. But before I do that, um, I'd love to have you talk about the like the photo shoot to web workflow and um, what we call that usually is content velocity and just being able to move images and video through a workflow much more quickly out to the actual end customer experience. So can you talk a little bit about what how it changed once you went composable once you started using Cloudinary, the time frame like what it used to take to go from photo shoot to web? And then what happened to that workflow when you moved um, to Composable and, and how much more quickly you were able to achieve that? Mm -hmm. um, like it's a, so, so um, uh, what happens is when you don't have like, you know, so, so the need will always be there, whether you realize it or not, right? Like, so whether you have an enterprise dam or not, like, you know, it's the enterprise dam, like, you know, so don't get uh, like, you know, so, so, um, afraid of that big name and, and like, uh, hence, like, you know, so, so budget, et cetera. But, but really, it's simply like you not know, so, so putting together uh, a, a like you not know, so, so needs like so which any company will have right like an, an offering as a service or a product right. So before we have had that like you know, so which means that we have had like you not know, so six different like you not know, so homegrown solutions like you know, just, and some of them could be very manual like you not know, so emails right like you not know, just so I have. Uh, like you know, so work, let let's let me take like you know, so our our um, art directors right like you know, so when uh, from the time like you know, so we get the uh, samples and shoot photography and then like you know, so we'll do like a uh, let's say like 200 shots on a model out of which we'll pick two right like you know, so, so and for that process so now like you know, so imagine exchanging like you know, so the ideas like you know, hey the lighting is not correct here and so on right so. Uh, like you know, so exchanging all of that, like you know, so having no workflow, right? Like the, using your email as a workflow, right? Like you know, there, there are a lot of inefficiencies. So, and not only that, like when it comes to like, let's say you have um, like you not know, so, so um, bring in another company to work specifically to optimize your assets. Now you need to move them out, move them back, right? Like versus like so you could potentially use like a you know, collections concept in Cloudinary, 
um, things of that nature. So like, so those are all the areas where uh, we have seen uh, improvements. So. That's great. And I, I recall hearing a metric that you went from three, when we think about photo shoot to web, three and a half weeks down to 20 hours, which is incredible. Um, and so Milan, let's shift gears a little bit. And as I was saying, let's have you um, talk a bit about some of the key use cases that you've been seeing um, Neiman Marcus Group use as part of uh, their overall, oops, sorry about that, their overall use of um, Cloudinary, starting with content velocity, kind of what we were just discussing. Yeah, so it's amazing. It's, um, you know, one of the interesting things about being cloud native is that you can do things at a speed that is humanly not possible, right? Um, so it's, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot of buzz around generative AI and chat GPT and stuff like that. Uh, and these are not things that replace the existing teams, but they're things that make the existing teams faster. So, you know, um, if you think about the fundamental technology that we built at Cloudna, it's all around being able to uh, manage visual assets, images and videos better. And so there's technologies there that allow you to auto tag stuff. So it's not just the metadata that you had put in the old fashioned way, but all of the auto tagging and all of the recognition of what's actually in your images and videos. So we do a lot of deep analysis on it. So we know what's in that image. We know what's in that video. And um, you know we have AI models that are trained up to do that. So what that does is on the organization part, which is the front end of your workflow where your art directors or your creative team is working, we give them a little bit of velocity and a little bit of an up leg there in that portion of it. But then you look at the next thing, it's your digital teams that are going to actually transform these images and make them ready for each individual channel and uh, you know for even each individual page like your PLP and your PDP as we mentioned, right? So again, all of that was done, being done manually in the past, but here you just kind of say uh, G underscore auto, which is one of our technical parameters that just says, hey, auto gravity, the, the shoe is the hero in this image and make sure that crop is always perfect. And as uh, you know, you're looking at it responsibly on a Mac, uh, on a MacBook Pro as I am right now, or on my iPhone, or on an Android device, or a tablet, you know, make sure that shoe is still there, right? If that's at the center, if someone resizes it, flips their phone, whatever. Um, and then there are advanced effects that you might want to do, right? So you have to remove the background of some of these products. You might want to put a normalized uh, web, um, you know, a background that fits with your, um, uh, brand um, uh, guidelines. So you have this gray in this case. Uh, you might want to put an invisible mark, watermark or a real watermark in there if you're putting these images out somewhere else. Um, all of these things can be automated and they can be done real time and on the fly. You don't have to do them all using Cloudinary, but we have that full tool set uh, built into this foundational platform, right? And then there's the last mile as we talked about, which is it doesn't make sense doing all this if the final image that someone's seeing on their screen or the video they're seeing is buffering up or breaking up because of low bandwidth issues or because you've served it in the wrong format. So again, we do all that, the, the auto format and the auto quality, and we basically integrate with the CDNs underneath and even do a multi-CDN strategy where we're finding the fastest point to get to you. So whether you're looking uh, shopping for shoes when you're in a hike on a hike in Montana, or you know, you're know you at home with a blazing fast connection, you're still getting a very good quality of image with the right compression, with the right bandwidth, and so on. So, so that's that full um, workflow that you can now automate using Cloudinary. And then um, if there's anything more you want to touch on rela uh, related to omnichannel delivery, that would be great too. Yeah, I will. And then I'd, I'd love to get Sri's thoughts on this too. Yeah. But really omnichannel is, is, you know, it's a buzzword that is very hard for people to activate campaigns on every single channel. So if you think about the work that's required to do this, uh, you know, you need different 
sizes, different uh, imagery even, and different, it gets even more uh, harder when you start using video on multiple channels. And you need all of these to be ready all the way in your buyer's journey from whether they're looking at you for the first time on your website or they've heard about you in you know through something that someone uh, sent, shared with them on WhatsApp or something on social, on Instagram, or maybe even in-store or the fitness app for your brand or whatever the case might be. So there's many different touch points and you can't humanly create all the imagery variants required. So again, this is where AI can give you a little bit and the machine learning models that we have that are actually content aware uh, of uh, you know, the object taxonomy as well as the subject taxonomy. So we know, you know are there celebrities who are models, for example, in this shot or, you know, and then you can use that for your rights management, et cetera. Or you can use it just to kind of change these layouts. As you can see, this is all happening automatically, whether it's on an iPhone or an um, iPad, or it's on your retina display. These are the three layouts. So again, these we also create these widgets, uh, like the product gallery widget, which um, uh, is used uh, by, by Neiman as well. And I'd, I'd love to hear more from C on that. Uh, but to kind of make this easy, so you can put this in a modern layout, you can use different kinds of media types, whether it's images, video, 3D, 360. Again, we have the capabilities. Not everyone uses every single one of these. That's up to the brand and their style, right? Um, but that's that's the capability underlying. Okay, great. Sorry, my mute button sticks a little bit. Um, well, we are getting down to the last 15 minutes and I wanted to, first of all, make a call out. We have a couple of really good questions already in the Q&A pod. If you have any questions in a couple of minutes, we're gonna to move to the Q&A section. So feel free to load some questions in there if anything's coming up that you'd like to explore a little bit more. Um, so with that, we're gonna move into kind of the last section, which is really talking about Neiman's biggest learnings. Um, so Shri, you've mentioned in the past that things, and this is very common in, in technology, thinking about people, processes, and technologies. It's like we always think about those three categories when it comes to experimentation, when it comes to learning and strategy, but specifically here, would love to kind of have you share with our audience um, some of the experiments that you've been conducting and some of the biggest learnings coming out of that and how you think about people, processes, and technologies. Just maybe a few examples would be great. Yeah, um, so like it says, so when it comes to um, experimentation, like so it can be, um, like so I can bucket it into two. One is like, so for any e-commerce company, this is at the core. If you're not doing it, you should you should definitely do it, right? Like, so run as many A-B tests as you can, right? Like, and, and, and give yourself like some impossible goals to hit and it's okay. And because like it will motivate you to actually get there. And um, like you know, at times, like I so said, you would, you would potentially probably hear, like I said, I cannot run like more than one test at, at a time on a page, like you know, so, et cetera, but, but challenge yourselves, right? Like you know, so, and, and figure like you know, so which technologies will help you to actually do that, right? So, so because you learn a lot, like you know, so oftentimes, like it's just the uh, your your customer or like you know, so always tells very very clearly, uh, like you know it's just the and it's just that like so we need to uh, listen to them and uh, A/B testing gives you that uh, uh, capability and uh, when you do that like you know it's just the for example let's say I mean uh, I'm just um, hypothetically speaking let's say uh, like and so we wanted to uh, build your own um, wedding ring right like and you know, so let's say like and you know, so if I mean in a true North Star goal, potentially for something like that, like, you know, so you will have infinite, so many options, right? Like the cut, like, you know, so the quality, um, the size and dimension and whatnot, like, and so, but before you do all of that, you could potentially, like, just create a page with a content page, right? Like, you know, so have all your images loaded into Cloudinary and then through via your CMS, build a beautiful page and have some JavaScript to uh, run some, like, you know, so create, give that illusion, right? Like, you know, so it is dynamic. And then, like, so showcase like so different images as customer is uh, like so making those selections and see um, if your customers will actually interact and if there is interest. If there is, then you can build in the background like a truly end-to-end -end solution. But let's say like so well, like so not many people are doing it online, so uh, you only you save yourself a lot of time and heartache, right? Like, you know, this is the 
So, so that's one area. And the other one is like, you know, so from an experimentation standpoint, which it, it's it's probably like, you not know, so deeply technical, but but um, like uh, I remember like, you no, know, it's the, uh, like it's um, I was I was like, you know, so in the serverless framework of, of ours, like, and you know, so for one of the uh, use cases, like, and you know, so I thought like, you no, know, so um, step functions, like, you not know, just the uh, or or where like, you know, it's the like so functions, one function calls another function, and then overall you can orchestrate the flow. Like so, I thought like so would be a pretty cool thing to do. And uh, when we tried that, like so while the, in theory it was good, but in practice it was not. Right, like you know, it's so and uh, uh, and and uh, didn't pivot. Right, like so it's okay. Right, like so when when and when one of your experiments failed, like so nobody is saying like so three years of it. Right, like you know, so all we are saying like so uh, we all like so. so um, looked at what we have and then made a choice and we tried it and it did not work, but build yourselves like you know, so a resilient team and platform which will allow you to pivot, right? But if you, if you like for example, like you know, so on any of these experiments, you spend a lot of time or law, make a lot of investments, deep investments, then it becomes very problematic, right? Like you know, so. Um, so, so that's that's um, the uh, like one of the greater learnings. Like, so we have had. Uh, so. Great, thank you. I, I find that so interesting. One thing that you said that I want to kind of lob over to Millen. You said, challenge yourself. Really, like set goals that are so far beyond what you think you might be able to achieve to really push yourself, and to use technology to enable that. So, I'm just going to flip to the next. Um, slide, which is really all about innovations and how to be more innovative when we think about visual storytelling, how we bring images and video and all the capabilities um, around that into storytelling and using these more innovative capabilities. Um, so Millen and Mitch, we'd love to have you kind of chime in as Millen talks through these things when you think about experimentation and where you're going to go next. Um, and things that you're already doing that are that are capable um, and you're able to do today, would love to hear that. So, Millen, um, if you want to talk a little bit about some of these future, more innovative end-user experiences, that would be fantastic. Yeah, well, the the future is here and now because uh, you know we have many customers who are actually using 3D models and generating 2D imagery for their PDP and PLP using that as kind of an acceleration in terms of the velocity of how they're creating stuff. Uh, you know, uh, in the product gallery, they're using 360 spin sets that have been used. Uh, we have customers who are using AR so you can visualize what this uh, piece of furniture or what uh, uh, a particular piece of art looks like on your wall. Um, and then, you know, I, I mentioned chat GPT very early on, but, uh, you know, with GPT-4 and some of the things that are possible conversationally, we've been using, for example, open AI technology for natural language processing. So when you go to the media library, which is part of our digital asset management or cloud native assets, that solution, um, you know, you can say, hey, I need all imagery that looks like this or has a red-haired model with uh, summary um, uh, clothing, right? With uh, summer clothing, and so you can you can do those kinds of similarity and natural language searches. And as we do integrations going forward with things like GPT-4, how do we bring some of these underlying foundational AI technologies? and marry them with the foundational image and video technologies that we have, create machine learning models that can actually be trusted by brands and give you results that you want to use, right? And uh, give you moderation workflows so you can adjust those. So the whole thing is about increasing your velocity to do this. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it becomes even more interesting with video. You know, today's capabilities with video include things like you know, trying to figure out what's the content of the video. Are there two people in the shot that are important to this lifestyle video, not just one? Uh, is the product important to it, uh, not just this? Can I change the background? Can I take a longer form video if I'm sharing that on one of my other sites, uh, or a lifestyle video, and then summarize it quickly as a three second shot using AI? Can I speed that up so I can actually do that? So we have a lot of underlying technologies that are enabling you now kind of to take the smorgasbord of capabilities and decide what's right for you at the right time in your experimentation 
and uh, and kind of move with that. So that's really what we are focused on is that foundational image and video technology and incorporating uh, the best in uh, science, the best in formats, the, uh, innovations there, as well as the best of AI and content-aware machine learning. Excellent, thank you. All right, well, we are at that moment. I think it's time to transition over to some questions. So um, I'm gonna just fire some off to you. Um, Shri, I think this one is specifically for you. How are you measuring the efficacy of the campaigns you execute in your composable tech stack from an A-B test um, while serving personalized content and in performing deeper analytics to measure different business experiments? That's a very long multi-part question, but I want to take a stab at answering that one. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's a great question. Like, like you know, it's just the, um, I mean, like every company, like, you know, just, I mean, uh, <clears throat> will go through this, right? Like, you know, it's the, because like, you know, so your customers, like I mentioned earlier, like, you know, so your customers are always telling you, like, you know, so you just need to, listen to them in, in the sense that what they're clicking, what they're interacting, what they, where they are, like, you know, so where they are stumbling blocks, right? Like, you know, so, and when it comes to personalization, right? Like, you know, it's just the, um, is how much of personalization is good, right? Like it will feed into uh, recency versus relevancy, right? Like, you know, it's just the, um, and uh, uh, like, you know, so let's say, like, you know, it's something in, in theory, it will be like, uh, like, let's say, if I personalize, like, so let's say, like, so I'm, I'm wearing this shirt, right? Like, let's say, if, if Shri is shown this, like, he will probably buy more. But then, like, so when Shri comes to the website, hey, I already have this. I would want to get introduced to something totally, like, no, I do not have, right? Like, no, so that you, you, or I would think, like, no, so, so hey, this this website doesn't seem to have very many products, right? So, so striking that right balance, right, like, is extremely important, right? Like, no, so, and we have only learned that through A-B testing. And, and there was there is no other measure we could have like you know, so, um, put out there and, and figured this. Like it's so when we have, for example, have had personalization at a certain percentage, we saw success and, and like tremendous success. And then like, and so, okay, like, let's crank it up a notch. And we saw like, like, you know, so, like complete opposite, right? Like, you know, so, so um, you know, like it's, so that's, that's how um, that, and now uh, when it comes to the composable architecture, right? Like, you know, it's, just, it's the speed to market, right? Like, you know, it's just the, on a, on a monolithic platform, like, you know, so you would only be able to do so much, right? Like, you know, so however strong your technical team is, like, you know, so just by nature of it, right? Like, you know, so versus when you are able to, uh, like, you know, so create a very um, purpose-built service or, like, you know, so UI, and or like you know, so you have like the right uh, technologies to uh, for your to, to do the testing, right? Like so you'll now be able to uh, put these tests out there faster, and get feedback and 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 progress. All right, great. That's that's a really strong answer. I appreciate that. All right, we are down to the last two minutes. One quick last question that somebody had. Um, they're actually saying they're currently still using a legacy dynamic media product. Maybe it's something like a scene seven. What advice, I know you guys were using scene seven. So what advice would you give to this person to kind of start migrating away from that product and migrating away from the siloed tech stack, which you spent a lot of time up front talking about kind of the silos and moving compo to composable, but anything specific about the migration away from a scene seven tool? It's, it's, um, I would, I would, yeah, like, you know, so, so I would, I would ask, like, you no, know, so, like, it's, um, uh, the best thing to do is, like, you no, know, so look for, you should always be looking, like, you no, know, so for what else is out there and, and compare and contrast. And from the features, like, you know, so, um, then map them back to your business processes and, and what you can gain out of, them. like, you no, know, it's just the, and if there are going to be, like, you no, know, it's just the, um, without a question, like, you no, know, so, so you will get benefited, like, you no, know, so go for it, right? Like, you know, so, Another thing to also consider is like, you know, so your omni-channel content strategy, right? Like, you know, so whether, like, you know, so, um, like, you know, so whether it is scene seven or, or a product, right? Like, you know, so how well it is um, integrating with all the other systems you have, or is it working in isolation, right? Like, you know, so for example, like, you know, for us, like monogramming, right? Like, you know, so is, is uh, like, you know, so is an area where you would do the overlay of like how that font would look like and so on, right? Like on the images, um, and um, like and also, so if if there is a business model which is supporting like and also which which 
uh, uh, like necessitates right like or something of the sort right like and how that future product and roadmap looks like and correspondingly like so you need to figure the technical roadmap right like so that's that's how I would I would go address that um, then specifically like you know, so uh, moving from one to another excellent thank you all right, well, here we are. I think, Adam, I'm handing it back over to you. I just want to remind everyone there's some great content to download. Be sure you check that out. And thank you all for your time. Um, but Adam, take it away. I know you're going to close, this, close things down for the day. Well, I, I am. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to all of our speakers and our sponsor, Cloudinary. Um, you'll be able to access this uh, webinar on demand uh, by uh, clicking on the link here. But for now, uh, we'll say good afternoon. And again, thanks to everybody and thanks all for joining us today.